please take your seats quickly uh, as we're about to start. We're just a minute or two late at the moment. Before we do start, I would like to ask that everyone who has a device capable of making noise, please make sure that it does not make noise, because if it does, everyone's going to look at you and then mock you on Twitter. Um, that said, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, her name is Jessica Ford, and she'll be giving us an introduction to reinforcement learning. Please make her feel welcome. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jessica Ford. I'm a visiting fellow at Harvard University. Um, and just so I get a general understanding of what you guys all remember from uh, statistics and machine learning, how many of you guys have done anything with reinforcement learning? Oh, wow, okay, that's, that's more than I expected, okay, cool. Uh, and uh, how many of you guys remember like introductory probability? Great. Um, and uh, how many of you guys have done any deep learning of any kind? Okay, cool, cool, cool. So this is a bird's eye view of this talk. So this is, this is an introduction with a capital I, an introduction to uh, reinforcement learning. This is, I mean, if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, this is like the first couple chapters of Sutton and Bardo with a few notable examples. Um, so this is introductory probability. Um, I don't expect you guys to remember calculus. Um, so no deep learning is required. Uh, and these demo problems are things that we can run live. Um, we're gonna go over some really high level concepts of reinforcement learning and talk about some old school classical algorithms. So what's reinforcement learning? So reinforcement learning is a branch of machine learning uh, that is focused on the learning of policies. And, and what's a policy? A policy is a way of connecting states to actions, right? So if you have some state of the world or even an understanding of the state of the world, which is our observation, what's, what, given the options that we have, what's the best available action? Now to evaluate this, we have some sort of reward or cost metric and uh, we want to be able to come up with a robust way to minimize cost or maximize reward. So we're going to go over the simplest type of, a machine, of reinforcement learning problem, which is bandit problems. I don't mean raccoons, I actually mean slot machines. Uh, so a multi-armed bandit. Bandit problems have two states and K actions, right? So uh, we're going to start at the same state. We're going to pick one of these bandits, which is like a slot machine. The slot machine will give us a reward. This reward can be deterministic. It can be random. And then we just go to the end state, right? So we want to figure out which bandit, which slot machine is the best one to pick. And so to understand what a bandit problem is, we have this notion of regret. And Regret basically is the opportunity loss for not following our optimal policy, right? So, so we have for every, for the number of times that we've played with the bandits, we have this uh, value function, which is Q, we're gonna talk about a little more, and uh, the sum of the rewards. So it's the number of times uh, we've played the game times the average expected value of the best option minus the rewards that we've received so far. So this is where we get into this idea of exploration versus exploitation. And basically, we want to be able to understand the reward from each possible decision, right? And uh, we need to get to, but we also need to get to the optimal policy, right? So there's, there's this trade-off between when we want to explore and when we want to exploit. This is, this is uh, shared across other disciplines. You'll probably hear about this also in the optimization. And so I'm going to go through this simple problem in a Jupyter notebook. So can you guys see this? No, no, please. We this we have time. So oh, we have time. So you know, uh, please ask questions. You know, this is this is this is supposed to be a conversation. Um, so again, we have k options, and uh, for each i option, we receive a reward from this distribution of rewards that's specific to that kind of bandit. And we want to be able to get to the, op figure out what the optimal bandit to pick is as soon as possible. 
So we're going to talk about the one of the simplest ways of trading off between exploration and exploitation, which is epsilon greedy algorithms, right? So epsilon greedy algorithms basically say that with probability epsilon, we're just going to make some random choice. Right? So that means that with probability one minus epsilon, we're going to take the best choice that we know so far. So I'm going to be using this open source library called Jim Bandits, uh, which uses the same similar API to OpenAI Jim. And we're going to pick the 10 arm Gaussian bandit, which is on page 30 of Sutton Bardo, if you all remember since uh, you probably have seen uh, the Sutton and Bardo book. So basically, uh, the 10 armed Gaussian bandit has, uh, has 10 bandits with rewards that are normally distributed, and the rewards are distributed according to these parameters. So um, these are the mean values for each bandit. And as you can see, uh, bandit number zero is our, our best bandit to pick, but we're going to try to figure this out just through simply playing with these 10 bandits. So by just taking these, again, taking the index maximum of these bandits, we can figure out that this one is zero. Does anyone have questions, actually? Because we can, we can pause here while I'm getting this thing changed. Yeah. Uh, reinforcement learning, Sutton and Bardo, the uh, second edition is actually in I think it's about to be published. It's, it's uh, available online for free. It's great. Um, and it's a really good classical uh, introduction to reinforcement learning, and it has a new update with uh, some things about uh, deep reinforcement learning. Yes, in the back. Oh, should I, can I increase the font size? Let's see. Command shift plus. Command shift. Does that help? Does that work? Command plus? So command shift. Plus, plus, is that, is that better? Oh, command minus. Is this better? Is this easier to read? Okay, great. So I'm going to be putting together a data frame that collects the results, right? So I'm going to be uh, pulling the these pulling these bandits a thousand times, and I'm going to be setting epsilon to 0.1. So again, that means that uh, with probability 0.1, I'm just going to pick a random bandit. Um, and I'm going to be collecting metrics for uh, what arm I picked, what reward the bandit gave me, um, what epsilon was I using, uh, what is our measure for regret, um, what's our policy so far, so what's our guess of which bandit's the best bandit, and then random policy is simply did we pick a, pick a bandit at random, right? So if you look through this code example, um, again, I'm just taking a random, uh, I'm taking a random binomial um, with probability epsilon, and if it comes up, uh, I'm going to take a random action, and if not, I'm going to be selecting the policy that we have so far. Um, we are going to step through this environment, and then I'm going to calculate the regret for that reward, and then I'm going to populate our data frame with the results of what we get. Um, and then again, I'm going to take the argmax, um, the argmax of the means of these bandits grouped by the bandit, right? So that's just some, some pandas in there, right? So I've run this already, and again, we have a fixed epsilon, we have calculations for regret, and we have whether or not it was a random policy and what our reward was and what arm we picked, right? So, this is a simple frequency count of the number of times we've selected each bandit, and as you can see, we, we select the zero bandit the most times, so that's our guess of what the best one is. And as we guessed, um, one approximately 90% of the time, we've ended up just going with the policy, as we know. Now, what we can also get out of this is our estimates for our Q values, which is basically the expected value of each bandit, right? So we have Q hat and Q star, and green is Q star, blue is Q hat, right? And so, you know, 
as you, as you can see, like for the bandits we picked less, we don't necessarily have as good an estimate. For the bandits we picked more, we have a pretty decent estimate. Um, zero and eight were the ones the most picked. They're relatively close. This is our growth of regret. And theoretically, regret uh, with epsilon greedy grows linearly because even when you know which is the best one to pick, you're just still gonna be picking something random with probability epsilon. So in order to have some linear regret, you're gonna want to tune this epsilon down to converge to a greedy policy. And I've just reset this up again and rerun it. And again, I see, you see I highlighted this line here. This is just this update for epsilon since, and we're just tuning it relative to the number of iterations. And then we've just joined this with our old results and you can see the decayed epsilon grows sublinearly and the epsilon greedy grows about linearly. Now, this, your mileage may vary, right, because you, you're gonna be, there's still some randomness in here, so um, depending on when you run it, it'll look differently. But, you know, we've averaged over the regret per iteration and you can see it general, ep, epsilon decayed generally does better. So back to our presentation. But what about statistical testing, right? So um, bandit problems are often used uh, to compare to A-B testing or to be used in technology companies to figure out how you wanna set up your buttons or something like that. Um, so A-B testing, randomized control tiles, and statistical testing describes differences between two or more methods and their outcomes. Right, and, and there's you know, a big discussion of which you should do and which one's better, and I'm not gonna get into this rap battle, but basically the difference is exploration versus exploitation, right? Because like in, in bandit problems, you just wanna get to the results that's the best option as soon as possible. And when you're doing like a randomized control trial, you really wanna be able to understand what the difference is between your control and your treatment, right? So if you're doing a randomized control trial, typically, for example, you're going to be assigning uh, an individual, for example, if you are having a, a clinical trial, for example, um, approximately 50-50 or evenly depending on um, how many options there are, right? And so you really want to be able to understand what the statistical difference is, right? Because you really are looking at understanding what this distribution of outcomes is. Um, but in a bandit problem, you, you mostly just want to get to the best result as soon as possible. So now we're going to extend this idea to look at longer term planning. So a Markov decision pro process is a way for us to understand how actions change the environment. And this is where we get into the basic setup of these three different th pieces, which is your state, your action, your reward, your new state, and your new action. Right, so in this little graph here, you have three states, and you have two actions, and you have these transition probabilities that go between these actions, right? And there's a little graph that shows how you're going to be traversing these three states. Right, so, so if we know these transition probabilities, then we can use dynamic programming to solve this MDP. So dynamic programming and reinforcement learning basically comes down to if you know what will happen tomorrow, then you can accurately plan today. So basically, like, if you're looking at this maze, for example, right, you, this is your goal, your G, right, your G is your goal, and you want to be able to figure out how to get to the goal as soon as possible. So using dynamic programming, you're going to be working backwards from your goal to figure out how to get to the goal as soon as possible. So going back to the technical notation, we have states, actions, rewards, and these rewards are associated with the state action transition into the new state. We have, this transition has a probability distribution, um, and using some discount factor, we want to optimize over the value function. Again, as I said, there's two kinds of value functions we can think about, which is Q and V. Our Q function is our value of taking action A when we're in state S, right? And our V function is what's our, our ultimate payout out of being in this state following the optimal policy. So we're gonna go now looking at a code example for a markup decision process. 
And uh, let me see. So let's see. Can, Is this, is this good? Can you read this? No? You want it bigger? How about now? We're good? Okay. So, uh, again, as I said, dynamic programming, backwards induction, right? This all boils down to this equation called the Bellman equation. And uh, if by recursively computing these value uh, estimates, um, we're able to reach the optimal policy. And so we're gonna have a simple grid world, which is a maze example. And so this is what our grid looks like, right? So this is a reward. Um, and the reward basically is our estimate for what we get for being at this location, right? So um, this is a simple heat map, right? So the, the blue means we get a reward of one. In this low spot, uh, red means we get a penalty of minus one, and then all the other spots we have uh, a, a small little cost of, of being of travel or of being there, right? And then in the middle, we have just have this little wall to make things a little more interesting. In this age, in this world, uh, our agent can go up, down, left, or right, and we're going to assume that 90% of the time the agent ends up going where it wants to go, and 10% of the time it veers off. Uh, and again, and uh, basically in terms of the transitions, um, if it ends up in the pitfall or the goal, the game is over. So this is a simple heat map of our transitions. And right now we don't know what our policy is, right? So what we do know is that if you're in the goal or the pit, you're gonna leave, but uh, everywhere else we don't know how we're gonna get to the, to the goal. So now we're gonna use value iteration to solve for the optimal policy and we're gonna just assume a discount factor. Uh, now, our, again, our Q values, this is gonna be a tensor of three dimensions, right? So um, one dimension is gonna be the number of rows, the, num the other dimension is gonna be the number of columns and our third dimension is gonna be the number of actions, again, because the parameters in your Q value are your state and your action. Right, so the state is gonna be described by your row and your column. And then your V value is just gonna be a copy of your grid. I have a simple function that describes how we traverse through the grid. And then uh, this, is, this is basically our update for our Q function. Um, and for each row and each column, if we're at the end, we're just gonna take the V value of what we know so far to be the row and the column, right? And if we're not, if we're at the wall, then we're just gonna fill in the wall because we don't, we don't have the state information for that place. And then for each action, we're gonna fill in the rewards for each action, right? So then, in this case, we have uh, your uh, estimate for the grid of the Bellman equation, which is basically the reward grid RC, which is our, our reward table. And then we have gamma times what our V values were for R and C. And then to just get the expected value, we just do a simple dot multiply with our transition. Now, we're gonna run this once, and then this is our estimate for our Q values. And then we're gonna use these Q values to update our V values, right? And so that's a simple argmax to get our V values. I mean, a max for our V values and then an argmax for our policy. So we're gonna take those. And then after one iteration, we can already see that uh, this location is looking pretty good. And we know that we're gonna wanna go to the right if we're, we're in this location, right? And if we run it again, these two locations begin to heat up. 
And as you can see here, this location already knows it's probably a good idea to go to the right. This location knows it's probably a good idea to go up. And then we're going to run this to convergence. And as you can see here, right, this is our, our estimated V values, right? So um, as you can see all the way in the corner, right, you have like a pretty low V value because it takes a long time to get to the goal. And then in the closer you get to the goal, the higher your V value is. So this is our final policy, right? So it says that if you're in this location, you're gonna wanna go up and then to the right. So what if you can't do dynamic programming, right? So dynamic programming requires that we know what these transitions and states are. Um, but we wanna still estimate our Q values um, without a model of these transitions, right? So I'm gonna give you one simple algorithm to learn this. This is SARSA, right? And so uh, SARSA um, is nice because it has a simple mnemonic, which is the, the parameters in the equation, which is state, action, reward, state, and action, right? So again, you're gonna be in a state, you take an action, you get your reward, you're gonna go to a new state, and then we just need to know what the next action is. Uh, again, and then this, is this, this method is known as model-free because we don't need to know what these transitions are. So if you remember what Q, our Q values are, right, it's our expected value of taking an action given our state. So one way of finding these Q values is by taking an exponentially weighted average of the Q, the, the Q estimates we get and then updating them with our uh, parameter alpha. So we're gonna now redo this with SARSA. So again, as I mentioned, we are, we're using this, this uh, epsilon value and we're gonna decay it. Um, and we're gonna have these Q values, right, which are, again, going to be the number of dimension in our state and our number of actions. And then just so I can keep some statistics on this, I'm gonna count the number of times we take each action in each state. And I'm gonna be following an epsilon greedy policy again, turning this down again. And then if you wanna see the update equation, our update equation is, where is it? Source equation. It's here. Right, which is our old estimate of Q alpha, so sorry, our old estimate of Q uh, plus alpha times the reward we get plus gamma times our Q values of our new action and state minus our old estimate for Q. So we're gonna run this 200 times. Now, technically, you probably won't wanna run it more, but I just kept this relatively short so we could get a good understanding of how this works. And I've populated a data frame with our number of experiments that has the number of moves we've made, our total reward, whether or not we hit the goal, and what our epsilon was. And again, I'm tuning down epsilon. And as you can see here, we get a pretty good understanding of how to get to the goal from this start location and then we have some estimates of our Q values. These are the number of times we've taken each state in action. This is, we've just heat mapped this um, in terms of each state. And then these are our results. So again, we basically get to reaching the goal pretty quickly. Um, there's some few times where we, we don't know what to do and generally, you know, we're reducing the number of moves and we're tuning down epsilon. And as I, I mentioned earlier, now we're, we're mostly getting to the goal. So, 
Uh, tabular RL problems are, I, I think they're actually really great because they have a lookup table representation, so they're easy to store, they're easy to interpret, and they're fast at test time. Um, so basically, you know, like um, I worked on a problem, of, for example, um, with uh, heating decisions for a commercial building, and in my project, we ended up producing a lookup table that said, for example, uh, how, what you wanted to do, what sort of actions you were supposed to do for the building given environmental conditions for that building. Now, uh, a lot of interest has been in uh, deep reinforcement learning, which is an extension of deep learning um, that kind of takes in this information from visual input typically um, and is able to turn that into a policy. And obviously the canonical paper is uh, human level control through deep reinforcement learning, which was in Nature in 2015. Um, and it int introduced a lot of really important ideas, um, which was deep learning with functional approximation through um, I'm sorry, functional approximation to, for the Q function, right? So we have this image of this, this game, and um, through this Q network, we're able to estimate the value of taking each kind of action. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff that's in the paper, like uh, experience replay, which is basically a way of getting around uh, these correlations and samples that we get through playing the game. And then there's obviously uh, the AlphaGo paper, which is also very exciting. Um, how many of you guys have seen the, the games online? They're really great. So, uh, and then for, for people who, who want to be able to work with their own uh, reinforcement learning problems and don't know what to work on, um, there's some really great resources online uh, from uh, the research community. Uh, Jim is one of them. This is from OpenAI, and uh, you can use deep learning, you can use any sort of method for taking these uh, environments down and playing with them, and they have a simple API similar to what we had with these bandit problems. So the, the one I suggest people start with is probably Cartpole. Um, there's also Frozen Lake, which is pretty similar to the grid world example I had, um, but this is a really great one, and it has a description online uh, on their website for how to play with Cartpole. Um, an extension of this is OpenAI Universe, um, which has a few more games, and it also has a, uh, some uh, web uh, environments to play with websites. Uh, RL Lab, which is also from OpenAI, has some more modern implementations of different reinforcement learning algorithms. DeepMind also is in the open source uh, reinforcement learning game. So uh, they have DeepMind Lab, which is, again, more games to play with. Um, again, it, they have uh, methods for uh, evaluating the quality of your gameplay. And then, um, although this is technically dialogue, but a lot of people are looking at dialogue through the lens of reinforcement learning. Um, open, uh, sorry, uh, FAIR, Facebook AI Research, uh, has also put up uh, Parlay, uh, which is a uh, open source library for dialogue. But the important question for you all is, are you going to be able to solve your own problems with reinforcement learning? So if there's one thing I want you guys to remember, it's that diagram, right? So the diagram, again, is has the important pieces of reinforcement learning. You have your agent. Right, which is your, your actor on your environment. Um, your agent acts on the environment. It gets a reward signal. Um, and based on the state that it's in, it transitions into a new state. Right? So to know whether or not your problem makes sense for reinforcement learning, you're going to want to know that you need to take actions on your environment. Typically, these actions affect your environment. And these actions have rewards or costs associated with them. And you have either observational data or a simulator to work with. Uh, some general tips. Um, there's, there's a lot of de interesting details in terms of how you're going to put together deep reinforcement learning models or um, classical reinforcement learning models, but um, just some general guidelines. Uh, obviously, again, parameter setting really does matter. Um, a lot of people end up just looking really, really exhaustively for these sorts of models um, in terms of when they're going to cut off learning, what these different parameters like 
alpha or gamma or epsilon are going to be. Um, and then also, you know, you're going to want to evaluate your results across multiple runs because, again, like, you know, if I, if I take these things, you're, even my results are going to change, right? So if I, like, just for example, like if I rerun, I'm just going to rerun it for you again just so you see, especially with, like, something like Sarsa, right? So I'm just going to rerun this. Let me see if I can. Sorry, I'm going to try to just run this all below just so you can kind of see just how it changes. But if I run this all below, right, like, these statistics all change, right? So technically, this graph looks different, right? If I, if I run this banded problem again, right, if I run this again, I'm just, I'm resetting everything, right? If I run this again, I'm just going to go down to comparing my regret, right? Like sometimes if I run this, it's not necessarily going to, like absolute, the, the results might necessarily change. So let's see if I run it. Still running, let's see. Right, this is, this is my regret. And it's still going. But yeah, if you can see here, like they, I have like, I have, I have generally different results, right? So you're going to want to run this multiple times to kind of evaluate the quality of your model. Uh, in terms of resources, there's a lot of resources in addition to the ones I mentioned. Um, again, as I mentioned, the, the Sutton Bardo book is really great. Um, there's some really great videos online um, from Peter Beale's CS188 class as well, um, which also does some stuff with deterministic search and other games. And uh, I'll take some questions. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, please move to one of the microphones in the aisles. Hey, thanks very much. That was great. I uh, was just wondering if there's a copy of the uh, Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub anyway. They are, actually. Um, there, yeah, it's, uh, if, you, um, if you go to, let me get it. Um, they are online right now. Um, I've, been, I've been making these changes, but if you go to There they are. Yep. I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about function approximation. You, you uh, went straight to deep RL. I was wondering what the current kind of state of the art for when, when tabular stuff is too simple and uh, whether or not uh, there are implementations in Python that are available. Yeah, uh, so in terms of function approximation, technically the state of the art is deep reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, I mean, you can, uh, I mean, there, there are, again, if you look at RL Lab, there are some standard implementation of, of those, some of these kinds of deep reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, there's some other function approximation stuff in there. I, I would look at RL Lab. Um, and in terms, uh, sorry, um, did I miss any other? Okay, great. So, um, oh, sorry. Hello, uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you saw differences when people add arms later on after starting the experiment. Like so suppose I'm talking in the multi-armed bandit case. Yeah. And I started off with K arms. Yeah. And later on I add two more arms to it. And have you seen differences in your output then if you add arms later on? So when you have a long running bandit. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's a, I mean, there, in terms of bandit problems, I, have, I haven't necessarily worked with bandit problems where I've added bandits. In fact, um, my knowledge of bandit problems is mostly from the literature. Most of the stuff I work with is uh, longer term planning. Uh, so. um, Thank you. <laughs> with respect to uh, reinforcement learning versus agent-based modeling, how would you describe the two of them in relation to each other? And when would you use one versus the other? I'm not sure what, what you, but agent-based modeling. Like, but I mean, like, what's I mean in terms of like, uh, it, 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 to me, it seems like there, isn't the difference just a, a, a nomenclature difference? I mean, technically, reinforcement. Nope. Sorry. 
So, uh, I, I'm, I'm not really necessarily familiar with. Um, yeah, I think I think that's an I think that's a I, I'm guess I mean I'm not necessarily I think isn't agent based modeling from like the OR literature? I, I, I was trying to figure it out myself. That's why I'm asking. I think it's the I think that's what they just use from the the operate. I think that's just nomencla uh, nomenclature different from the operations liter research literature. Um, I'm not an OR person, um, but I think that's it's. I, but a lot of I mean, there's a lot of borrowing in terms of methods from one another. So yeah. I, as far as I mean. I think the, the Sutton and Bardo kind of gives a, a broader context for how this relates, like outside of the CS context. So, uh, but okay. I think it's an. I think this is. I think this is largely a nomenclature difference. Thank you. Sorry. Um, advice from the uh, operations room is that. Uh, in view of the uh, fire alarm announcement, is just do what it says. Wait, are we supposed to leave? Uh, no, well, I believe the announcement is asking us to remain calm where we are. Um, do I have to, how much more time do I have for Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, we have one more question, and then I think that's going to be it. Hi, uh, not sure if you commented on this, but when the uh, environment doesn't give a reward straight away, like maybe it gives a reward later, so, what's the yeah, strategy? So, yeah, long-term planning is a really important kind of problem. I mean, like, as, as, as you can tell, like, you know, I, I, I gave people, I gave the agent a little bit of a cost for traveling, right? And so, but sometimes you have, like, if you look at OpenAI Gem, right, you have, like, a, a certain, like, these robotics problems where you're supposed to be able to complete a task and you're not, you don't get it until you actually are able to figure out the, the, the end state you're supposed to end up with. So, so long-term planning is obviously a big uh, challenge in reinforcement learning. And it's, it's, an, it's an open question. But I mean, there are some really great um, environments that, that allow you to play with that sort of idea. Right. Do you have any more questions? Please thank our speaker.